Welcome back to the Volvo Ocean Race, and boy, <laughs> if there isn't a cracker. They're basically three days into this, uh, into this final sprint, but you don't care about that. You want to know about when all of this action is going uh, to finish up in The Hague, and, and most importantly, which one of these boats, or potentially Dongfong, is going to win the league. So I'm here, uh, as, as always, in Alicante with Richard Mason, a uh, long-time uh, participant in the in the Volvo Ocean Race. So, Richard, have you ever seen anything like this before? This no. is ridiculous. Nothing has ever existed like this in yacht racing before across the board. Yeah. And to think 43, what was it, 45,000 45, nautical miles, yeah. and it's coming down to this. It is it, it, absolutely phenomenal. At the moment, looking at our, the information we have around here, the delta, so the difference between these two groups of boats could be less than 15 minutes. We, we could be seeing a driving duel coming downwind into the finish. It is nerve wracking. I've got goosebumps. Yeah, it, it's, it's pretty exciting. It's not just because the air conditioning has turned up too hot. <laughs> um, it is incredibly close. If you are a sailing fan, you need to be tuned into this right now. This has never been seen before in and potentially could never be seen again. But, no, but uh, the, the era of the one design has brought us this incredibly tight racing. Yesterday, we talked at length about this incredible decision that the sailors had to make. Was it the Western option? Was it the Eastern option? One was favored, but more risky, and that's the one that, that finally Dongfang Racing took. Matt Frey was thinking about going down that route, but they bailed out, and that option cost them dearly. Put them in behind the Dutch boats, and now, Richard, they're gonna have to pull pull something special out of the bag to grind down the boats ahead. Yeah, absolutely. It's, uh, it's quite deceptive when you look at the trackers and maps at the moment because you'll see these red areas in there and basically they're exclusion zones uh, which, where the boats have to sail around. So what we've sort of got at the moment is, is the one boat group down on the shore that's being led by Dong Fong and they're almost on the wind so they're mm -hmm. reaching along but they'll have a very good angle as they slowly bear away. And then the boats that are out in the west, they'll get a little bit lifted and lighter and they'll end up sailing dead downwind exactly. into the Hague. So, so we'll stay on, stay on this. Um, yeah, it's important to explain. On this map, yeah. So I'll, I'll get my, uh, my fancy finger painter out and uh, <laughs> explain what is at stake here. So basically, the, the option that took the western one... Oh, can we, can we go back to Tracker for a second? I'd just like to explain this, thanks. So basically, they need to go around that corner, and then it's basically a handbrake turn, isn't it? Yep. They go in towards the Hague, and there's one buoy um, buoy off that uh, all the boats need to go around. So a bit of a zigzag on that side, whereas, uh, in contrast, the boats, well, the wind shows the Dongfong is on a reach at the moment, but they're actually pretty hard on the wind, basically upwind. Uh, and then, well, it's a blast reach all the way down, and so, so the, there's the, the question of the angle. One is going to be downwind, one is going to be on a reach, which is the favoured angle for these boats. But also remember that we've got this high-pressure zone over on this side. So you mentioned the isobars. The wind is basically funneling down from the northwest, uh, and that means that, um, that you've got less wind on, on this side of the field and a lot more wind on this side. So we're already seeing the difference there. The boats on the... Um, on the west are already slowing, Richard. Yeah, and, and the most important thing to have in our heads here is the, the arrow, this where you see the white that's coming across the map, that's the wind direction. And uh, the boats out on the west will be sailing more dead downwind, which is a slower, more maneuvers type thing. And the boats that are in on the, other, on the shoreline will be sailing a straight line at a, at a faster angle. So uh, slightly different modes. And, and they're going to come together at probably very close to that mark. And uh, That's when everybody's going to be jumping up and oh, down. Oh, yeah, all our hair will be falling out. That's going to be fantastic. <laughs> or what I've got left to have fall out. So we're, we're locked in on these, these helicopter images. Um, they were recorded just, just moments ago. They are still uh, too far off the coast to, to bring you live images on the cellular network. But uh, this is what the picture looked like just a few minutes ago. So Team X Nobel still punched out, leading that fleet. And, um, and this is a boat that we know have got legs. Basically, um, it's, it's incredibly tough to try and pick a winner out of here because everybody's got their condition. They've done 45,000 miles. They know the boat's like the back of their hand. And um, what is it going to take to get to, to have a shuffle in, the, in this uh, lineup? Well, I think it's at, at the moment, so there's a little bit of straight line sailing going here until they, until they get to the corner. So you'll see both the boats are set up exactly the same. And the difference here, differences here in these conditions because they're, as you can see, the sea's pretty flat. They've got a little bit of this following swell. So they'll be like a little rubber band sort of coming in and out to one another by meters. But the, effectively, the, the separation will stay. But the minute that they come in and start sailing, downwind and start jibing, 
that's when they'll be able to actually start attacking one another as well. So uh, using smaller variations in the wind, slight shifts to gain, you know, get some separation and then attack and, and, and try to gain. So we'll see, we'll see these boats attacking one another going downwind, which actually gives the boats on the inside another advantage. Bit of an advantage, yep. Because these guys will actually be fighting with one another mm. and effectively slowing one another down because as soon as you start doing manoeuvres and yeah. fighting one another... You're not on the optimal route anymore. Yeah, yeah, you're not thinking about these guys which are scooting up the shore down yeah. here, who will also start fighting. So it's, it's going to be fantastic, really. Yeah, uh, just so much going on there. It's, it's like an onion. You can keep peeling away the layers. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, there might be the tears to go with it at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> that's for sure. That's for sure. Lots of stress, lots of strain, and potentially... Um, lots of celebration and plenty of tears when they finally do make it into Hague. Yeah, oh, I mean, these, exactly. this is absolutely brutal what's happening out here. There, no one will have had any sleep whatsoever. In fact, I wouldn't even be surprised if some, there might be a crew or two that are actually in their bunks at the mm. moment because they're up on the high side, they're in the most efficient place for healing. Just to get half an hour, 20 minutes of something to recharge the batteries for this massive fight coming in because it's all going to come down to the wire and they were completely exhausted out there. Now, I'm just looking over my shoulder here and I can see the countdown clock uh, that started in Gothenburg. Remember, they went from Gothenburg up to Norway, down, down past the Danish coast, around again up to Norway, and then finally uh, down the western coast of, of Denmark when it was all on, plenty of breeze there. And every time that we've spoken with the sailors, they, they've said, you know, basically we've been on watch for all of that time. And that means two days, 21 hours and 23 minutes. Uh, so they're going to be absolutely on the ragged edge of, of their capacity to, to function at this point, let alone uh, do high quality maneuvers when you've got all of these jibing to do. Oh, yeah. And you've got the navigator that's got to, got to pick the spot. Oh, absolutely. I mean, the, the, the adrenaline will be keeping these, these crews alive out there at the moment. They'll be absolutely pumped. I mean, I'm pretty sure even if you wanted to close your eyes, you couldn't. You'll just be shaking in your bunk. So I can imagine that the coffee supplies are taking an absolute hammering on board at the moment. Uh, and they'll be doing absolutely everything they can to get themselves set up for this final, final push after sailing almost twice around the world. You've got to remember, around the world once is 27,000 miles. Uh, and now that we're, we're at 45. It's ridiculous. It is, uh, it's phenomenal what's happened here and for it to be so close in points at this stage. And an interesting one, I had a, a question earlier on, uh, of course, uh, a lot of people don't quite understand the extra point that Dong Fong have yet to get uh, and I think they're around about 20 hours, wasn't it, ahead of the next boat? Uh, ahead There's, of Brunel, that's yeah, right. Yeah, Brunel, yeah. So at this stage, uh, with a delta of 15 minutes, you know, something pretty catastrophic would have to happen to Dong Fong for them not to get that point. But it is not in the bag yet, though, until they're over the finish line. It's not. You're right. Uh, it's good to clarify that because we do talk as if everybody is on an equal standing with 65 points. Yeah. Uh, in, in effect, that is, that is, um, that's the way it's going to be. But, uh, but you're right. So... Do need to clarify that, but we do have essentially three leaders, although the boat that is leading out on the water at the moment is, uh, is Team Axnabel being hunted down relentlessly by these two boats here. Now, earlier when we were talking about this, you said that uh, you felt confident that Matt Frey has the ability to grind them down. Yeah. Now, I'd just like to remind you about that, because you said that they've got a really fast VMG mode, so we've seen them uh, sail really well downwind. Yeah. Uh, but they've, they've got some work ahead of them, and the crews, that, the crews that are in front of them have proven that they're fast as well. Yeah, absolutely. I'm actually spotting two different sails here. Um, right at, at the moment, and this, uh, I don't have my glasses uh, on, no, I could be in trouble. But, uh, on the previous view, I think that we saw the painted corner of the uh, Okay, it's just looking to me like Brunel, yeah. we're on an on a, on a A0 there, and yeah. that um, Maffrey might have been on mm. the throw. But um, uh, we'll see, we'll have another look at that in a second. No, but I, I think we've seen it in the import mm. races that um, uh, Maffrey have a, a lower mode, you know, which means they can sort of for the same speed go a bit slower. So once they get into VMG downwind, uh, you know, that could come into play. Interesting to see the swell here. You know, there's a, a lovely lump in the ocean there helping push the boats along. But when you look at the sea level here, you can actually see that the, there is a high pressure system around. You can see that the, uh, there is a dying swell here and then the breeze is, is dropping out. So they'll be using these uh, swells to really help push them along and just get every little ounce of speed out of the boat, every little surf you can get to put a little bit of distance between you and the boats behind. Yeah, although uh, this sort of sloppy leftover uh, over swell, it's, it's great now that they're, they're on the pressure and they've got this nice, uh, nice reaching condition. Uh, just to put that in perspective, we've got a, um, a true wind angle of, of sort of 96 or 100 at the moment. So in the light conditions, they can take these sails that they normally do broad regional VMG running with quite yeah. high. 
Uh, but this is also going to be the same sail that they're going to bear away with because as the wind drops off and the boat speed becomes more closer to the overall wind speed, they're just going to use the same sail for the same downwind as well. Right? Yeah, exactly. It's all it's all about apparent wind angle yeah. sailing. So it's the you know the the, uh, the angle that the wind comes at the boat at as opposed to the true wind angle, which is uh, you know the direction that the wind is coming out of. But yeah. lovely shot there of Axel Nobel really smoking along, all powered up. You can see this just right on the edge of their maximum healing moment, and we've seen that a lot with these boats. So Sort of we, we've gone back to a bit of an old school type of sailing where you know, we went through a period in sailing where we used to try and sail the boats as flat as possible and these boats love to be healed so you, you see them all the time they're looking for, for more power so you've got the bow popped out there enjoying a nice little wave uh, it looked like Nico uh, just <laughs> judging by the stand so I think it's Chris Nicholson driving there at the moment um, and everyone working hard you can see the main sheet coming on and off they'll, they'll be grinding that main in and out on every, every single wave. little yep. wave it'll just be trim on trim out look at that I mean what's that got to be 25 boat lengths max yeah we're so talking about bag of maxi worlds here it's, uh, <laughs> yeah, they're coming down bomb alley it's nothing and then of course we got the the red boat hunting them down in the background and I mean the big scheme of things we're, we're looking at an, an, an import race yeah, we're, we've seen here. bigger differences in import races. Yeah, we than have. We have you know, so it's just uh, phenomenal <coughs> to see this. It really is. And the boats are all looking pretty similarly set up, just charging along there. So we've got distance sailed, uh, pretty significant, sort of 990 miles al already. So uh, plenty to come, plenty done, uh, as you say. And so almost a thousand miles, and you've got this as, a, as your gap. It, it's, it's just absurd. It, it biggest belief. Um, but but Richard. I'd uh, like to benefit from your experience because you've sailed with many of the different characters on board these <laughs> boats right now. Yeah. So sort of talk us through who, uh, well, who are the big personalities, who are the people that can make a difference uh, when it comes down to the final miles? Well, let's just get one thing clear. Every <laughs> single crew member on every single boat out there is a big personality. They've, uh, you know, they're, they're all just about to achieve something absolutely phenomenal, which is where they've already sailed around the world. But to have completed this race in its current format, is um, it is just absolutely phenomenal uh, is what they're about to achieve. But talking about the characters out there, you know, you've got you know, Bauer Becking, who's a very sort of calm, calculated, doesn't say too much, but he feels the pressure, so he'll be pushing pretty hard. You know, KP, he'll be getting quieter and quieter down there, he'll be looking for options and, you know, mulling things over uh, and trying to put options out on deck and then pushing them through. You know, he gets quite quiet and has, he's got a... He's got a fantastic sense of humour, so he'll be using that to try and lighten the mood on board. Uh, Nico, you know, he's uh, he's got this intensity around him. So you know, on board Axel Nobel, there, you know, you've got uh, a Martina Grail there as well. Um, you know, so it's a, a real sort of there'll be an Olympic type driven performance coming in. And then we're looking at Vestas here. Uh, you know, probably one of the driving characters out there at the moment. So it'd be Tony Mutter. You know, he's uh, he's been in this situation many many times before. I think he did uh, his first race on, uh, I think it was a Tokyo OECD yeah. actually. Uh, no, Swedish match actually. So Tony's been in this situation, you know, many, many times before. And uh, you can see Phil Harmer driving away there. Now he said uh, he said two victories from, yep. from the That's race. That's right, Group Harmer and, yep. um, and uh, Abu Dhabi. Yep. Joined so, there by former Abu Dhabi colleague uh, Simon, uh, Fisher. Simon Fisher. So yep. plenty of experience there. And they uh, can really, uh, really help to be, um, to have not only one race around the world, but but two. You know, yeah. you almost finish each other's sentences. Oh, you know, yeah. uh, what what needs to be done before um, before the decision is made. And the, so char the character of the boat is quite important, like yeah. you say. And then you come over to the to the French team at the moment, and the intensity on there will be amazing. You know, you know, Charles is very driven. There'll be emotion. There'll be um, and because of the separation, they'll be really. You know, nervous, you know, because they, you know, there's some elements that they won't be able to control, yep. and they know this is all going to come down to the why. So I can, there will not be a single rope tail, even slightly to lure it. Everything will be stacked up to weather. Everyone will be doing everything they do. Can shuffle over to weather, just to get the writing moment up. They'll be thinking about the next sail change, checking the foils to make sure there's nothing possibly that could be slowing them down. So. You know, it, it, it's the intensity. I, I've got goosebumps just watching it. I sort of wish I was out there, but I, I, I also know the t pressure they're under. Yeah, so it's not going to be good for your heart if you were out there, mate. So no, exactly. That's for sure. So Vestas Eleventh Hour Racing um, got some work work to do. Uh, they they did sort of lose out a little bit in the shuffle uh, when. Um, when the boats had to choose the option east or west. They were third yeah. on the water when we saw them with our last helicopter sortie uh, yesterday. Um, but, but certainly you're right, Pas Pascal Bidiguri and, and Charles will be feeling the pressure knowing that these yeah. guys are, are in a favoured position. Different sail yeah. on this one too, actually. These guys are on the J-Zero. 
the other two boats were on the A zero, so leading boats. Yeah, uh, Marcy Kazir yeah, at the so moment. I was actually yeah. talking to Tony Mutter about this and uh, you know, Tony's background as yeah. a sail maker, and he's been the brainchild behind a lot of, uh, of sail yeah. developments in this race. And uh, he was saying how fantastic the sail was. So you know, it's ended up a huge range that they, they use the sail over. So um, you're seeing a bit of Tony's character coming through here that you know he's yep. got the boat using uh, what he believes in the sweet spot. And um, you know, they'll be trying anything at this stage, anything that they think might give them some mm. sort of advantage. If they know a sail better, they'll use it because... Yeah, it's been really interesting that even after, as you say, 45,000 miles, that there's still a diversity of opinion uh, on the fleet. Yep. They're in the same condition, you try and do the same job, and you, do, and you can set the boat up differently, hoping to get an advantage. And indeed, uh, that was something that I remarked uh, when they were doing the downwind run from Norway uh, into Aarhus, that we had the two leaders, Dong Fong yep. uh, and Mafre. Mafre had the J0, the J3, the J2, trying to soak that down into a downwind mode. Uh, so normally sails that were made for light wind, upwind, or reaching. Yeah. Um, whereas Dong Fong had the uh, had the Marcy Code Zero and the, the J Three. Yeah. Same condition, same same perspective, different sail setup. And so um, I had a bit of a chat with Ken Reed about that as well earlier on in the race, and and he said that they were totally blown away at North Sails. They made their sails to do a particular job, light wind, upwind. And then, and here they are using it in every condition but that. Yeah, and uh, apparently it's very, very powerful and heavy airs downwind as yeah. well. So um, you, know, you you sort of uh, it's you just stumble across the and stumble. It, mm. uh, we saw it in the uh, when we were developing the new sail program for the boats. We actually saw the potential performance there, and of course it takes the sailors to then take that potential sail usage mm. and develop it and understand how to use it, which they've done out here. But I, I just it's so hard. I mean, we've got to keep coming back to it. This finish is. Phenomenal. I mean, you think of this in world sports, yep. just in general. What other sport in the world is there that goes on for nine months mm. at this sort of intensity and comes down to the wire like this? The I mean, Soccer World Cup's going on at the moment. Imagine if those guys had been put through anything like this. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I'll get my, myself in trouble if I start giving my opinion about football at the, at the moment. Um, I was just setting up there and didn't fall into it. I'm disappointed. I saw um, it coming, mate. But certainly, yeah, they're out there playing for 90 minutes, and, um, uh, and but not nine months. And uh, and certainly, the, there's no play acting when it comes to, um, to to fouls or injury. These guys have picked, they've bled for this position. They've picked themselves up. They've fought their way through all the worst conditions in the world. Uh, and, and here they are. And actually, to, again, to put this in, into perspective, um, my normal co-host, Niall Mayan Best, and I, at the beginning of the race, were scratching our head looking at, at how we can make these comparisons and how we can bring it into other sports. And so we looked through the archives of, of the 100-meter sprint and, and uh, sprint finishes in, um, uh, in Olympic triathlon and looked at the difference and said, well, if you've got a photo finish at a 100-meter sprint, what does that equate to? Uh, in this kind of stuff. And actually, this is one of the most competitive races in the world in any sport right now. That oh, in absolutely. terms of the delta and in terms of the mile sales, nothing can touch this. This is, yeah. it, you know, the boats might only be doing 15 to 20 knots right now, yeah. but this is the closest racing that exists in the world. So this is a good shot here to show you the difference of what's going on in the two boats. A little bit more breeze in shore, but they're on the wind. So they're, they're probably sailing around 50, 50 true here. Just cracked, you can see that the sheets are outboard. So fast on the on the wind sailing here, but they'll slowly start bearing away here, and the boats are up to weather. You, you know they're 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 with the swell and scooting along. So about a two knot difference at the moment, but then in about an hour or two, once we get close to the boats hitting the corner of these exclusion zones, then the deltas will switch the other way, exactly. and these boats will be going faster. So right now on Dong Fong, they'll just be going. Oh, God, you know, yeah. come on, come on, come just on, come on. Just trying to grind down yeah, the difference. Yeah, trying to grind it down. And the other boats will be trying to make every single gain they can because basically they're putting their money in the bank right now for the for their next move. Exactly. So just before we went on uh, on air, obviously the, the distances have changed. Uh, but basically there was 10 more miles to sail for Dong Fong than for T-Max Nobel. Yeah. So... Oh. Big difference, but uh, but as as you say, it is favourable conditions right now for uh, for the Western bunch, and uh, as the French say, they, they need to eat their black bread. If we manger le pain noir, <laughs> <laughs> that's the expression that they use. Uh, they, it's pretty so, fancy for a kiwi. 
Well, sorry, mate. You, you speak Swedish, I speak French. <laughs> it's not bad for Kiwis all around. Um, but basically, this is the moment that they're suffering, that they know that the others are in the optimal position. But as you say, the tide will mm. turn. And, um, and actually looking at the stack, we saw yeah. that the J0 was up on the top of the stack. I presume yeah. that that's going to be the next be change. The next one. In fact, tide's an interesting one for yep. you to bring that up because uh, off the coast of the Hague there, Den Haag and the Kremendinger, that coastline up and down, there's a lot of tide that runs up and down. So it runs parallel to the coast. And uh, so that will actually become a bit of a factor as, as, uh, as the boats start coming in. They'll be pushing against that tide. And generally, you know, if you can get a bit closer to the shore, there's slightly less tide. But you have to be quite close in, and it's quite shallow. So it's, it's a bit of a gamble, but you could have uh, you know, two, two knots of adverse mm. current against you, which effectively makes you two knots slower over the ground. So, but uh, you're yeah. looking at Dongfeng, they're all powered up. Yeah. You see the uh, keel fin coming out of the water there. So uh, yeah, you, you're definitely uh, ticking the box for having a powered up at that point. That's for sure. So we've got the, the windward, windward rudder is completely out. Great shots. The, the root of the, of the keel fin uh, also aerating a little bit. So they need to balance that because if they get more, uh, more heel on the boat, then, uh, then they get more power. But then yeah. also once you start cavitating that foil, uh, then it starts yeah. dragging as well. It's so always interesting to watch. You can see the wheel here. So you can see Kevin's, uh, he's helming at the moment. He's really moving, that, so the boat's very well balanced, mm -hmm. even though it's very healed, because you can see he's only moving the wheel a little bit. You know? So if the boat gets out of balance, if there's not enough power on the front of the boat, you'll see the helmsman moving the, hel the, the rudder around a lot and it creates a lot of drag. So you know, not surprising that they'd have the boat completely locked in after saving sailed so many thousands of miles. But, uh, you know, totally different scene here at the moment. You know, you look at the boats out on the west, and you can see the height. You know, can you think that there's not a huge difference? Not a huge distance, difference out on the water. But very, very big difference in what we're seeing on the water here. As you, you can see here that the, this is much greyer, and there's more white caps, so they're generally a little bit more breeze. And you can see the, the swell coming across them as opposed to the other boats that was coming from behind them. And, of yep. course, this part of the world is uh, one of the most the busiest shipping channels in the world. In the background there, you've got an oil rig. So, you know, there's windmills out here, there's oil rigs, there's fishing boats. It is possibly one of the, the, the busiest shipping channels in the world. And uh, you're, running a, you're running a yacht race out here as well. So there's, there's plenty that can happen. All of which goes to explain why those red boxes are out in the water, that we want to... There's one of the oil rigs uh, in the background there. we there. go. And that's, <laughs> that's exactly why. Yeah. Um, that uh, there's, you know, as you say, incredibly busy waters and the, the race uh, control here in Alicante at the beginning of the race, identified those risks, said those zones, no, nah, they're out of bounds. We don't want to go play with them. We don't want to put uh, our status at risk. And so uh, that is sort of what has set up this incredible jeopardy of, you know, pick your spot and commit to the channel because uh, there's no way that you can bail out or have any second guessing w once you're in there. Let's have a little talk about the history of Dong Fong. I mean, their second edition of the race. Um, and you think of where they started from with this team. Uh, in the previous edition of the race, and they grew and grew and grew throughout throughout that race, and now you look at where they are now. You know they are in, you know at one of the just about to take the podium. Now you know it's it's a massive tribute to this team, and they're a lovely team to watch too. They, they, there is um, it's got character and it's got flair, and uh, dare I say it, you know it has the the French the French passion. Uh, and throughout the team, there's there's layers of management which are in there. You know, you've got. Um, uh, Bruno, who heads the whole team up, and he's incredibly passionate and experienced from both the America's Cup and the Volvo World. So he's making sure that you know, the, 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 the greater team is operating and in and around them. You've got Neil Graham. Now, Neil Graham is someone you, you just, you know, to a name, most young sailors wouldn't have a clue who he is, but Neil has come from the Fortuna days, the yeah. Silk Cut, way back in the race. Now, Neil is possibly one of the, the, the most knowledgeable performance people you could ever have in a team. And he sits quietly in the background and analyzes everything and just ankles out every little millimeter of boat speed that he can from the shore's perspective on the boats. So there's all sorts of competitions going on to bring a team to this level, not just on the sailing team. You've got the shore teams, they're looking for any single competitive advantage they can give the team out on the water as well. So through and through, you know, there's a massive team effort that's going into getting these boats to this position for us to witness what's happening out there today, which is, in my opinion, we're certainly making history within our race and within the sport of sailing. But I think in sports in general, global sports, this is phenomenal. Yeah, well, you're, you're exactly right. They, they came out of the blocks and sort of uh, overperformed uh, last time they, they got onto the, the, the last step of the podium. 
uh, pushing that very often, so there's <laughs> a little bit of history there. Yeah, yeah. Um, but then, then they put all of the resources, as you say, uh, that they could possibly want to try and try and win it, essentially at all at all costs. Yeah. Um, well, that's what so, this race is all about. Ab absolutely. So plenty of pressure on their shoulders. But now we'll um, we'll go to Sunkunkai Scallywag. Uh, we've got onboard images uh, that were recorded a little bit earlier, and. Um, uh, we, we've got an interview that we'll play for you shortly, where I had a, had a chat with uh, with Annemieke Bess, or Bessie yeah. as she's best known, uh, the Dutch woman on board, and uh, she was certainly pretty enthusiastic about life uh, right now, skimming along the beaches of, of Holland, uh, waters that she knows incredibly well, um, although she says that it was you know, pretty cut and dried. There's no real advantage in, in knowing the home waters, because uh, there's not too much you can do with all the TSS, um, just sort of locking things off. Looks pretty uncomfortable down there. Yeah. <laughs> Still back Although, the right. check out what's going on here. We've got the OBR coming up and, and cleaning the lenses for us. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> In the old days, uh, when my, uh, it was the OBR years ago when, yeah. when the crew had to do it. And, um, uh, we have a very, it was a very, Terry Martinez, who's a very yep. well-known um, uh, photographer. Spanish photographer, yep. He was coaching me on, uh, you know, his, uh, he was very frustrated with the Kiwi, and he said to me, uh, yep. you know where uh, you cannot have uh, water on the lens yep. if you take the photo. Yep. And I was like, yeah, okay, mate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Talk to me again. It's a constant yeah. job to keep the uh, yeah. keep the lenses clean, and what a magnificent job the OBRs have done to to bring us this rafe to to open up what it's like to live on board these boats. Which at times would be yeah. easier to have a prison term, I think, than get stuck on one of these things. <laughs> mate, and well. In that case, why did you keep on signing up? <laughs> <laughs> well, there's special hospitals for people like me, so. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, uh, let's tune in and hear from uh, hear that interview from Annemieke and, uh, and get the Dutch perspective. So, Annemieke Bess, or Bessie, the, the, the Dutch woman on board Sunken Kaya Scallywag, congratulations on getting back in home waters. Thank you very much. Yeah, we, uh, I must say, we are looking very forward to uh, to finish the race uh, as well uh, take over a few other boats, <laughs> as you can understand. I can well imagine. This is such an exciting finish. Uh, everybody is jumping up and down all around the world watching what is going to happen when the two fleets come back together. Um, how nerve-wracking was it to choose this option and sail down your home coastline? Uh, well, um, I let that part over to our uh, navigator, Libby, um, and we actually sail as fast as we can. Um, yeah, but uh, I think it's really going to be uh, nerve-breaking. Um, we At the moment, we're just um, uh, passing the ditch uh, coastline and we're sailing as fast as we can. Um, try to get closer to, to the tide and then go boat, boat for boat, basically. Now, you're obviously an experienced sailor in these waters. Uh, is there any sort of local tricks that you can bring to the team that help them get the jump on Turn the Tide just a, ahead of you? Yeah, I, I can't just say that up loud. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Oh, no, um, yeah, there's some... Yeah, I know. Um, well, there is some tidal and some... There's a lot of uh, exclusion zones, so uh, it's going to be a bit tricky, you know, to get, get uh, the nice lanes. Uh, and of course, uh, yeah, there's some tidal we have to um, get into calculation as well. Taking calculation. Now it looks like the tidal will be against you, certainly after you make the final turn down towards the Hague. Uh, does that mean that the boats are going to be right on the beach? And if so, uh, can the Dutch fans come out and watch the race unfold from their picnic chairs on the beach? <laughs> yeah, I think the Dutch fans uh, should be there uh, in any case. <laughs> uh, yeah, it all comes down to, um, I think it's, if we have the tide with us, uh, then we probably stay a little bit more um, offshore. But if it's going to be uh, the tide against us, then we definitely um, will uh, stay more uh, onshore. Well, Annemieke, this is your opportunity to talk directly to those Dutch fans, uh, if you can speak in Dutch, please, to ramp them up, get them excited, get them out to the out to the beach to watch the, the, the action and certainly the arrival in the Hague. This is your shot. <laughs> okay, nice. Okay, iedereen die kijkt, uh, we gaan, uh, we, zijn, we komen eraan, de hele vloot komt eraan, het wordt super spannend, uh, wie gaat er eens winnen? Um, het is sowieso gaaf om alle boten te zien, we komen aan over ongeveer um, 
7, 8 uur. Het kan nog ja, rond die tijd. Uh, dus uh, daglicht. En uh, ja, kom gewoon allemaal kijken, want het, is, uh, het, het wordt gewoon super spannend. Spannende ontknoping. Fantastic. Thank you very, very much for your, your enthusiasm, Annemieke. It's contagious and this is super exciting. Hang in there for the last couple of miles. It is going to be <laughs> amazing. So, all the best. Oh, yeah. Ab absolutely. Thank you. Cool. Enjoy. Bye-bye. That was Annemieke Bess giving us uh, her perspective and her excitement about coming uh, into The Hague, into one of her, uh, her home ports. And uh, this is the inside pack. And uh, just to give you a little bit of perspective, there's about 70 miles, if you draw a line between Dongfong Race Team and uh, Team Ex Nobel. Uh, so big, big gap on the water. Uh, in terms of the miles to be sailed, it's not, it's not a 70 mile lead by any means. This is still super tight, Richard. No, exactly. So they're, they're basically going to come around and sail straight at the mark. And the other boats have a big dog leg to do, where they've got to zigzag their way in through these exclusion zones. Uh, and that's where that's where the gamble's going to come in. So uh, is it once you're done joining it up, it's actually a very very close overall distance. Uh, and you know we think we know a lot about the weather and these sorts of things, but pretty soon it's just going to be coming down to local little clouds, little puffs, little things that are happening just in that region. Uh, maybe the land in the Hague is heating up a little bit now. Yep. Um, there could be so many people on the beach generating, uh, generating enough heat, heat and excitement to, to put a cloud up. You never know. You never know. <laughs> it could uh, come down to that. It sure. is going to be that tight. Uh, and who would have thought, you know, if, if, if we had had a wager here nine months ago, <laughs> we never would have taken it. Wow, well, go back to Auckland, you would never yeah. put Brunel in the top three no. lineup, not for a second, and what a comeback. So. Exactly. So uh, many, and, and, and also the, the technical problems with Mafre that put them out of contention on yeah. um, that leg as well. Yeah, absolutely. And then, and then it's come down to the wire like this. Yeah. And you know, looking at the quality of the way the boats are sailed in the import races, I mean, really, it is coming down to who one makes a mistake. And yeah. people aren't making mistakes out there. Exactly. I mean, the level of sailing that is going on is phenomenal. And I'll put it out there to any critic of this race mm. that these people out there are all sailing at the highest, highest possible level, bar none. Every bar none. single person on those boats. Yeah, absolutely. Massive yeah. respect. A massive, massive respect. And uh, part of that respect is, is putting on a good celebration when they finally make it to the finish line. <laughs> and so the, just in terms of updating you with the ETAs, it is, they are due in, of course, weather dependent, around 1,500 to 1,700 UTC. So add plus two to that. Um, and uh, that looks like they have built out an incredible village party. here. Yeah. They're ready for a party. This is going to be an, a stonking beach party. Uh, tell us a little <coughs> bit about what's waiting uh, for, the, for the fans when they get there, Richard. Well, this is phenomenal. This is all built over a beach. We can see where the boats are going to dock in there. The, the, I think the whole of Holland's coming. I mean, it's, it looks, it's absolutely phenomenal what's going on here. When you look back up the beach of, uh, of, of the Hague, yeah, it's just it's phenomenal. Look at all this. Uh, and it's going to be packed with people. Uh, stadiums everywhere. This is going to become the heart and soul. And I know that uh, uh, we got uh, Frank and his team there, Niels and, and the Hague. I've had phone calls all night long yeah. from the organisers there. What time are they coming? We're so excited. I think they drove the last bolts into the buildings yeah. about one o'clock this morning. And <laughs> look at it. They're all ready for them. It looks absolutely fantastic. And uh, we're expecting, yeah. uh, we're expecting th th since I think from yeah. a year and a half ago, the, the, the city of the Hague, has been um, super pumped about it. Oh this. yeah, yeah. They, they said to us very clearly that we yeah. are going to make this the best finish ever in the history <laughs> of the race. That's a big call. It's a big it's, call because it's, it's a big call to yeah, make. we're both Kiwis. Auckland's put on a good show before, but, but uh, uh, yeah. my history of bringing uh, into the race into the Hague and uh, certainly with the stopover last time was phenomenal. Mm. And I don't doubt for a second that this is going to be a f wonderful finale yeah. to an incredible race, yeah. and everyone deserves it. Cool. Well. Uh, of the fans of this race, I'm sure that you are also exhausted. It's been a long <laughs> nine months behind the computer screen. I hope you've got callous fingers from clicking on the refresh button. Uh, but uh, however you've been following this race, keep going because it all comes down to this moment. Uh, the boats are due in, as I said, around 1500 UTC. So do the calculations as to where, where that brings you in, into the world. Lots to come. Oh, it's all to pay yep. for. I can tell you the only thing that's going to happen now yep. is it's going to get more exciting. Yep. More exactly. goosebumps. Cool. We're going to have boats crossing, fighting, dueling. 
Uh, it's going to come down to the last 10 minutes, I promise you. Well, this whole thing. There you go. The last 10 minutes is going to be brutal. Get on the edge of your, of your seats and stay there. It's going to be awesome. Uh, we're going to be coming back again live uh, with the live arrivals and, and all of the prelude onto that. So yep. we're gonna, we can see those final attacks uh, live as they unfurl. Unfill, unfold. Literally unfill. Yep. <laughs> uh, hopefully nothing will unravel. It will just go with unfill. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, up now. we'll see you then. Okay. <laughs>